Hi, folks. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Miguel. I'm a product manager at Elastic. And let's talk about today about system thinking and Kubernetes observability. Uh, OK. Oh, it doesn't seem to be working. One, two, three. All right. Oh, yeah. So pretty sure that today you're going to see a lot of these presentations talking about Gen AI generated images and content. I did not want to be left out, so I tried my best. And I asked ChatGPT and Gemini to see if they could help me with a nice icebreaker joke. Whew, man, that was tough. So basically, Gemini told me we'd start with a green, which was kind of weird. And then it, the jokes were not land, didn't land. I'm not going to. You know, I'm not going to put you through the pain of reading them myself. Um, but what I can tell you is, if you're a comedian, your job is safe. You're still not going to be taken by Gen AI. So let's get cracking. I'm not going to, that's it. I'm not going to quote more uh, Gen AI. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Colombian. I've been living in London for 20 years. Uh, I'm an industrial engineer. I also studied computer science and worked in supply chain system management for a while. This is where I bumped into system thinking, then eventually moved to the telco world and bumped into Kubernetes, like what I saw, started working in cloud computing, and moved to observability. Basically, a little bit of everything, so you're a stereotypical product manager. Today, we're going to cover three sections. First is why system thinking? and talk about the challenges of using only traditional observability when observing Kubernetes. Then we're going to talk about some of the core concepts of system thinking and look into a way of representing systems. And finally, we're going to explore how to use system thinking to observe Kubernetes. And we're going to have a feature appearance by our friend OpenTelemetry here. So let's do a little bit of correlation. Uh, Raise your hand if you're here to attend KubeCon. Oh, no one here just to see me? OK, all right. Keep it, keep it up, keep it up. OK, um, keep it up if you're familiar with the three pillars of observability. OK, so we got good correlation still. Keep it up if you have been to Japan. OK, we, we have a good correlation. So. <laughs> But you, you folks know that correlation is not causation. So I do have a reason for these three things. And that reason is the Shibuya crossing in Tokyo, which I love. So I'm going to, I love an analogy. And basically, one thing about the Shibuya crossing is the biggest crossing pedestrian in the world, up to 3,000 pedestrians crossing every two minutes, 260,000 to 390,000 per day, or 1.5 million per week. So that's, that's impressive numbers. I love an analogy, and I'm going to try to use the, the crossing to explain system thinking and to explain the challenges of using traditional observability with Kubernetes. So the first concept is this. We get challenging levels of abstraction. So either we have tools that are very good at doing one or two things, but if you want to do something else, you struggle because it's very monolithic. It's, it's an abstraction that is very is simplified, but it's simplified to do one or two things. On the other hand, you get a lot of low-level signals. So you're lost in an ocean of low-level signals that are too complex. And this is what I call DIY observability. So basically, you need to correlate yourself. And good luck. You've got to be an expert not only on the tool that you're going to use, but you also got to be an expert on Kubernetes. Um, another topic is. It used to be normal only for large enterprises to be the only ones that could have a 1,000 servers, a 1,000 virtual machines. Today, any of you folks in the room can open up your laptops, go to a cloud provider, deploy a Kubernetes cluster, and deploy tens of thousands of pods. So if we think about scale, 30,000 pods, for example, emitting 50 metrics, we're talking about 1.5 million metrics every five seconds, depending on the scraping frequency that you have. And the last aspect is static and rigid views. So traditional observability was built 
for well-defined entities that were not changing. So you have basically your pets versus cattle. It was more meant for pets. So think if you have, I have instrumented my Shibuya crossing to read faces. All of a sudden, it starts raining, you get umbrellas, I have to re-instrument everything. So think about it from that perspective. Right, so why system syncing? So system syncing can help us with some of these challenges. So I'm going to show you some techniques to get to the right level of complexity, also some other to help us focus on what is relevant to observe. And finally, I I'll, will explore a way to represent these systems that is easily adaptable. So we have arrived to the system syncing to our second section. Um, when I did one dissertation, I remember I had a professor that deducted me grades because I quoted Wikipedia. But I trust that you folks, you are, you love community, you love the power of community, so you're going to give me a pass on this one, just because I really like how Wikipedia puts it. Puts it. So Wikipedia defines it as a systems way, as a way of thinking uh, to reduce complexity in the world by thinking of things as in terms of holes, but with interacting parts. So, but before we go now into further concepts, I just want to set some, some caveat, if you want to call it. So systems, systems thinking is vast. So we are going to focus on the core concepts, and we're going to uh, explore a way to represent these systems. But these representations are not architectural diagrams. So don't take, or modeling, don't take them as such. They don't have the persistent semantics. They don't have the rigid syntaxes. They are mostly for, to enable us to ch have shared under understanding, also to facilitate discussions. So when we have a complex system, we, we need to find a common ground where we can have those complex discussions. And these representations are going to have a short shelf life just because systems are dynamic. Um, let's start with, it, with the first concept. Um, the concept is called function. So function is what the system does, and it contains two parts. One is the process, and the other one is the operand. The process is the change itself, the thing, the activities, the transformation that is being done to the operand. The operand is the thing that is being transformed. So in the case of our Shibuya crossing traffic, we have a process which is controlling flow, and we have an operand which is traffic. So the function itself is to control the traffic flow. So that's the function of our crossing. Uh, we represent function as a white square. You can also find your own representation if you like. And another concept is form. So form is what the system is. So it's all the physical or informational embodiment of the system. It will include uh, material, configuration, instructions, so sometimes it's referred as mechanisms, molecules, infrastructure. In the case of our Shibuya crossing, is I'm going to take all everything that is part of the scramble crossing. So it will be like the traffic lights, the crosswalks, the signage, stream markings. And voila, if we put together function and form, we have our Shibuya crossing system. The only challenge is it's too high level. So it's but like I was saying, it's in the, in the one of the challenges that we have with observability is very monolithic. It's hard for me to observe something that when I don't know what's going on inside. So here is where we have a technique that is called decomposition. And what we do is we can identify the entities that are part of our system. Now we are going to observe this Shibuya crossing and understand all these entities. So in this case, I have selected pedestrians, cars, traffic lights, zebra cross markings, and drivers. I could go even further. I could decompose this into more uh, complex uh, parts, but I want to keep it at that level. Why? Because sometimes there is this Miller's law that talks about uh, the right number of entities that a human uh, can process is seven. I'm not sure if that's proven, but I like seven. I think this is a, is a good number. Uh, so the recommendation that some folks give around is try to keep it between five and nine. Um, so we have our entities. Now we're going to talk about how do we define which of these are most relevant. This is where we can define our boundaries. So in my case, I say I'm someone who is in charge of maintaining, maintaining the Shibuya crossing. So I'm thinking 
the entities that are part of my system are the things that are actually under my responsibility. And can, I don't have anything to do with maintenance of a car, even though it's an entity in the system. So I define my boundaries to be here. One key thing, it does not mean that just because I define my boundaries, I'm going to forget about everything that is outside. So actually, that's what we call the context. So now you have your system and you have the context. So I could just not go and say, yeah, pedestrians are not important because they're outside. No, actually, if you are going to design, you're going to understand how your system behaves. You've got to understand how many pedestrians are going to cross. So this is quite uh, why the context is, is quite important. Um, we move on to functional relationships. So there are two types of relationships. One is functional and one is formal that we will look into next. So the first one, functional, are relationships that how the entities interact with each other. So, and they're usually represented, or not usually actually, I, I want to represent them that way uh, with black arrows. And in this case, a functional relationship could be you have drivers that, whose function is to guide the cars through the traffic lights, and you have traffic lights that signal stop and go. So the rela relationship here is that the drivers will guide the cars as long as the traffic light is green or it will stop when the traffic light is red. The other type of relationship is the formal ones. So these are more structural. So these are the type of relationships that will help you understand how, what is the impact between components. Like if they're next to each other, for example, if we have the same case, we have the cars and we have the drivers, if there is an impact on a car, if there is an accident, you know that there is another entity in your system that is going to be impacted by, by this. So it's good to, to understand these, these relationships. Finally, we have my favorite concept, which is emergence. Some people call it a phenomenon, um, but the way that is described as well is you have, when you have a system and you have components that are working together, you get the emergence of extra attributes or extra properties that did not exist before you had your system. Uh, and there are four types of emergence. So the first one is emergence of function. So it's something that the individual components could not do on their own. Now you can do them. So in the case of my Shibuya crossing, we have synchronized pedestrian flow, which we didn't have before. Um, on the performance side, yeah, I guess you can say, yeah, pedestrians can, cr can cross on their own, but can they, are you going to get 3,000 people every two minutes? Probably not. And the third one is emergence of the elities. So everything that you think about non-functional properties like availability, reliability. In the case of our system crossing, I'm talking about reliability because I could change my traffic lights to be a policeman, but then I'm going to lose that. Am I going to have someone at 3 in the morning marking every two minutes for people to cross? Probably not. So that's where you lose the availability and reliability if you change your system. Finally, is emergence of emergency. So it's the things that we don't want to happen. So unexpected or undesirable behavior that we didn't anticipate. So if there was a malfunction in our system, the pedestrian lights were green, the traffic lights were green, you can imagine we have an accident. So that we have an emergency as, as such. So takeaways for our next section. Aim to understand the entire system, not just the isolated components. So that's holistic thinking. Break down into manageable parts so, and create meaningful, meaningful abstractions. So don't abstract it too high. Don't put it into ma unmanageable parts. So this part we can achieve with decomposition and composition. The third one is define the relevancy of your entities. So focus without losing your context. So this part is define your system boundaries. And the last one, understand the emergent properties of your system, so emergence. So let's now move into the applying of this system thinking into Q to observe uh, Kubernetes. I'm pretty sure you folks are way familiar with this more than I am. Um, so, but I do think that the temptation will be like, oh, OK, we got it. System thinking, architecture, fine. We have our system now. You got your control plane, you got your boundaries. Well, no, the good thing is that now I have given you much more flexibility to think of Kubernetes in other ways. So not necessarily solely about how you represent the things architecturally. 
So we can start thinking from the perspective of relationships and we can start thinking of ways that we can capture those meaningful interactions for us, our case, uh, for our specific problem or question at hand. I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, abstraction here and focus on these meaningful abstractions tailored to a problem or question. And if we move to the world of Agme Incorporated, who's using Kubernetes, we talk about two user roles, a cluster user who just wants to have applications running on their Kubernetes cluster and a cluster operator who wants to provide that infrastructure. In this case, let's focus on the cluster user who is, is keen on having application orchestration. So they love Kubernetes, they don't love the, the rest of the parts, they love to get the application orchestration. Um, if we define our system and we identify some entities, then we can see an example that the cluster user can go and use kubectl to store their intent in the form of manifest in, the, in, in etcd, then you're gonna have the control square in the API to understand if there is a diff, uh, trigger the cube scheduler to create some pods and put them on some on nodes. But I, I do feel that this is still very complex. I have way too many entities. So as this cluster user, I'm probably not too worried about all those extra components that I have outside. So I could compose, and you can see on the right-hand side, I could decide that I just wanna have all these entities as one entity that is the control plane. And more, I could also be interested in, actually stateful set are quite an important entity for me, so I'm gonna decompose stateful sets into its parts and I, I, I wanna see them to understand the relationships inside the stateful set. Um, one thing is we have achieved now our, what we call our meaningful abstraction, but remember, we wanna set some boundaries to define what is relevant for us. So in this case, I'm pretty much gonna say I'm a cluster user, I'm not interested in the control, well, I am interested in the control plane, or I'm not interested until I am, or until I have to. Um, so I'm gonna just put it as part of my context, and also nodes. Nodes for me are, I use nodes, and I wanna know what's going on with nodes, but I'm not necessarily 100% keen on observing nodes. Um, could be meaningful if you're a cluster operator, then it's quite the opposite. You're more focused on the infrastructure and you don't care what's going on, what users are using the infrastructure for. You only care about how the resources are being used. Or even if you, I was, I was chatting with someone else earlier and said, do you deploy your own Kubernetes clusters? And they're like, no. Well, I mean, like, do you m deploy them uh, vanilla? And it's like, no, who does that? And say like, well, uh, basically if you're doing managed Kubernetes cluster, then probably you don't wanna be understanding what's going on about everything in the control plane, but you wanna, know, you wanna keep it in your context. So final section, let's observe my application orchestration system. And this is where our friend OpenTelemetry has entered the chat. Um, one thing that I, do li that I like a lot about um, OpenTelemetry is that it's not just about collection. We also have this amazing, fa fantastic uh, context layer where you have semantic conventions, so a shared vocabulary, you have uh, resource attributes, and you also have the execution context being added where it's possible. And this is all being done uniformly, so we are able to tag our, 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 all our signals in the same way. So if we keep these uh, resource attributes and we see that they represent the entity emitting the telemetry, what this allows us is to now do a pairing. So we can identify, and, and I'm pretty much in luck here, because I can see that my resource attributes happen to be uh, specified in the semantic conventions resource attributes. My entities happen to be specified in the semantic conventions resource attributes. So yeah, so I'm a lucky guy this time. And what we can do is, some of you folks that are familiar with Hotel and the Hotel Collector will, under, will be familiar with this uh, picture on the left-hand side. So uh, in the Hotel ecosystem, there is a part that is, uh, you have processors, so to process data, transform data in a way, but one of the nice things that I, that I, that I can find as my uh, interest in, in monitoring Kubernetes is that is this Kubernetes attributes processor. So what it does, is it will tag my signals with the data that represents my entities. So the, the, the specs that I just told, the resource attributes that I just 
hold up now are being added to my signals. And what this does is that now we have uh, everything uniformly being tagged with, this, with the entities that are, are part of my system. But one thing that I want to do is we should flip this on its head because we want to move to an entity-centric observability. So now I have my system, and imagine all the creative ways that you can get to put together this telemetry in a way that represents your system and to understand the relationship between these entities. So basically, this is giving us like very, very nice creative ways to do this. Um, we could have, for example, a way to visualize uh, my entity, which is a pod, but not just the pod and the metrics of the pod. Like, I, like we mentioned, like, it's not about just observing a pod in isolation. We need to understand the whole system. So we could start bringing up other entities that we feel that are relevant, because now we know those functional and formal relationships. So we, can't, we start thinking, OK, maybe we should, if this pod just didn't get there on their own, so we maybe want to pull this replica set here. We want to understand also what's happening with the node, where our pod is running, even though it's outside of my context. And a more forward thinking is we could even consider telemetry that bakes in the functional and formal relationships or a model system that captures them. So it's a way to create a, this is, I know this looks like a service map, but it's not something created by traces. Ideally, it will be something that helps me identify the relationship between the entities. So as we were talking about the car and the drivers, then I could understand that there is a formal a structural relationship there, and I could represent that, and it will help me understand which entities are going to be affected when one of those goes down or when one of those is malfunctioning. Um, so recap. Kubernetes needs complementary uh, techniques to traditional observability, as we looked into. Uh, we want to reduce complexity. Don't be afraid of things being too looking like too easy, if we want to call it. You don't want it too easy, though. Uh, so we need to get to a meaningful abstraction. Um, the third one is systems are not rigid, so we are able to adjust this representation, and we should do it often. And finally, explore leveraging the open telemetry resource attributes in creative ways to help us not just understand emergence of your system, but m even better predict and avoid emergency. Thank you very much. <laughs>